Good morning, Forward Church. Welcome to Church Online. Turn with me to Mark chapter 10. And as you're turning to Mark chapter 10, let me ask you a question. Have you ever lost your dream? Imagine with me being 23 years old and watching everything you've worked for fall apart. That happened to a would-be football superstar in the 90s. After earning a scholarship to a major top-tier Division I college and becoming the starting defensive lineman, a series of injuries actually put this guy on the bench. And as a result, when the 1995 draft came, he went undrafted. Now, with all the optimism that he had, he actually moved to Canada to be part of the Canadian Football League, and his hopes were he could play a few seasons in Canada, eventually be recognized by someone in the NFL, and then he could move to his dream of being a football player in the National Football League. However, shortly after his first or second game in the Canadian Football League, the coach called him in and gave him the news that no player wants to hear. It's just not working out. And so he went from being a star athlete on a top-tier Division I college football program to now being cut from what many people consider a semi-professional team in the Canadian Football League. Now he flew back home to his home in Florida, and as he landed in Miami, he called his father to come and pick him up dejected, 23 years old, dream has fallen apart, and now moving back in with his father and mother. Now, as he is in the truck riding with his dad back to their apartment, he opens his wallet. And when he opens his wallet, he looks inside and he sees one $5 bill, one $1 bill, and a handful of change. Now, he rounded it up to $7. So he had $7 to his name. He would later say that when he got into his parents' apartment that he simply spent two weeks with a major depression hanging over his life because his dream was over. He actually took those two weeks to, uh, what he did during those two weeks was he took a spray bottle and a sponge and cleaned every square inch that he could find in his parents' apartment. He said that that's the only thing that he felt like he had control over. And during that two-week cleaning stint, he felt inside of him that voice that many of us have felt before, tell him that it's just simply time to let one dream go and focus on another dream. So he goes to his dad and he tells his dad, hey, I want to be part of the family business. And his dad tells him, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. So he wanted his son to live a better life than he lived, and he knew going into the family business wasn't going to cut it. And so he told him to not do it. He dissuaded him. But the son was very passionate and he knew he had to give it everything that he could. So he goes into the family business. Now his dream died and everything that he had worked for had come falling down, but he persisted and he went into the family business. And today that ex-football player that went into his family business has a net worth of $320 million dollars. You know him as Dwayne The Rock Johnson. He become one of the most popular and famous professional wrestlers of all time and is also one of the most popular and successful action movie stars of all time. He turned $7 and a broken dream into a $320 million net worth and fame and fortune, the likes of which he probably never would have received had he become a professional football player. And so this, his story is a story of hard work and perseverance and really what we refer to as grit. Today, as we go into Mark chapter 10, we see the final healing miracle that Jesus performs in Mark's gospel as he enters into the city of Jerusalem, where he will ultimately die on the cross for the sins of humanity. The interesting thing about this miracle, though, is this is a miracle that's a story of grit and perseverance. See, what many of us need to realize is that faith doesn't mean that everything's going to work out perfectly in this life without us having to fight and work for it and have hard work and determination, perseverance, and grit. And so today, as we look in Mark chapter 10, beginning at verse 46, we see the miracle of grit. Here we go. Mark 10, 46 says this, And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, 
a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. See, Jesus has been constantly making his way south from the northern part of Israel towards Jerusalem. He's entering in on the Feast of Passover, and Jerusalem is packed with pilgrims going up to the temple to worship during this time. And so as Jesus has made his way into the city, he's at his final location, Jericho, before he goes into Jerusalem. Now, you're probably familiar with the city of Jericho from the Old Testament. That's one of the first places that the children of Israel entered into and overtook whenever they went into the Promised Land. Now, this particular Jericho is the newer version of that city, which is located just about a mile or so away from the old Jericho. And there was a pilgrimage road from Jericho into Jerusalem. And most out-of-town visitors that were going to Jerusalem to worship would go down the pilgrim's road. Now, a little Bible trivia for you. This is the same road that Jesus refers to when he's talking in Luke's gospel about the Good Samaritan. This is the road where, the, where the, the man is overtaken and he's beaten and he's robbed and the Good Samaritan finds him. So everybody knew this pilgrimage road. And that's why on this particular road, many people who were poor, many people who were homeless, many people who were sick or who were needy would go and sit there and beg for money. See, they knew that it's important to go where the people are. We see that nowadays uh, with many people who are homeless or who are poor or who are asking for money. They will go where people are so that they can improve their chances of getting some kind of money. Well, that's where this man is found, Bartimaeus. So Jesus is on the way into Jerusalem, and Bartimaeus is sitting on this road, and he's begging. He's doing what, what beggars do, what people, especially in that day and age, would do. He's sitting on a cloak. He's sitting on a coat and he's begging for people to give him food so that he, uh, food or money or some kind of generosity. Yet Mark's gospel says that he heard that it was Jesus who was coming. Now I want to remind you that we see in Mark's gospel several people that come to Jesus because the word about Jesus had been spreading throughout the land. That's one reason it's important for us who've had an encounter with Jesus to regularly run our mouth about God. We should regularly brag on what our God is doing and what our God has done in our lives because you never know who around us may hear about what Jesus has done and come to Jesus because of the word of your testimony. I've got a friend, Pastor Mark Thomas, who has started a podcast called Evangelism on Fire, and he talks about sharing the gospel as lowering the boom, sharing the boom with people. And see, when we share the boom with people, when we share what God's done in our lives, People hear about the power of Jesus. That's what happens here. Bartimaeus has heard that Jesus has miraculous power to heal, and he has been blind. Now, we don't know for how long he's been blind, but we do know that he is, in fact, referred to as a blind man. And so he hears Jesus is coming by, and he begins to cry out to him, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Interestingly, this is the only time in Mark's gospel where we see Jesus being referred to as the son of David. See, that's a messianic title. So in the the ears of the first century Jewish people that were walking with Christ, they would have heard this beggar calling Jesus the long-awaited promised Messiah. It's interesting to me to note that we've seen the disciples of Jesus who have actually been following him. They're the ones that seem to be blind to who Jesus really is. Yet now we find this blind man who is the only one who really can see who Jesus is. He cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And look what happens in verse 48. Mark 10, 48 says this, And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. The crowd that is with Jesus heading to Jerusalem tells this man to essentially shut his mouth. They rebuke him, saying, Be silent silent. See, the reality is that for many of us, as we come to Jesus, as we come to the Lord in prayer, there will be voices in our lives that try to shut us down. There will be persecution that comes our way. There will be, sometimes it's from outside, there are voices, there are negativity, there are 
people in our lives that will try to stop us and silence us. Many times it comes from inside. We have doubt and insecurity and fear and all of these this dangerous, deadly cocktail of things internally that tries to get us to quiet down. And I want to tell you that just because you have opposition, that doesn't mean that God's against you. We all are going to run into opposition. We all are going to run into people that try to shut us down. That's why it's important for us to have grit, to stick it out, to keep going no matter the cost, to keep our faith, to keep our nose to the grindstone, as the saying is, and keep drawing in to God. The crowd, those are folks, check this out, guys. These are the disciples of Jesus that Jesus has sent out several times to go out and minister to people just like Bartimaeus. Yet while they're here in the shadow of Jerusalem, seeing the capital city in their minds, they think Jesus is going in to overthrow the Romans. Jesus is going in to reestablish the greatness of the kingdom of Israel. And obviously, in their minds, Jesus doesn't have time for some blind beggar on the side of the road. See, they forget that Jesus didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom in the first century. Jesus came to establish a kingdom within the hearts of all of humanity. And notice what happens in the second part of verse 48. They stop him, but look at the response of Bartimaeus. The second part of verse 48 says this, But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. See, many people tried to keep this man down and tried to get him to be quiet. They tried to silence him, but he refused to let their voices silence him. He actually cried out all the more. I've heard that that word in the Greek language means that he screams out, that he's very vocal in trying to get the attention of God. But notice what happens. Because he won't stop crying out for Jesus, Jesus does stop in his tracks. This is, just look at the picture of what's happening here. Jesus is headed to Jerusalem and he's walking. He's essentially passing by this blind guy. Yet, because the blind man continued to cry out to Jesus, Jesus stopped in his tracks. Guys, this is a beautiful picture of what prayer looks like for us today. Because the truth is, we're not blind sitting by a roadside watching literal Jesus walk by. That's a difference between the biblical text and us today. But we are people who are spiritually blind. We are people who are emotionally blind. We are people who are financially blind, who are in fact sitting by a roadside crying out to Jesus in prayer. And there are many things that will try to stop us from crying out. There are many obstacles. There are many events. There are many things that, like the disciples, will try to stop us. But once we continue to cry out to God in prayer, God will, we will get the attention of God. God will hear us. First John teaches us that we can have confidence that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And so I just want to encourage you today, continue to cry out to God. Like Bartimaeus, have a spirit that says, Jesus, regardless of what's happening around me, I will continue to cry out to you. Maybe you feel like your prayers aren't getting through to heaven. Know that they are getting through to heaven. Know that God hears you. Know that God is in the process, even as we speak, of working on your behalf. Know that Jesus is right there in the presence of the Father, making intercession for you. That making intercession is just kind of a fancy, churchy way to say that God is going, that Jesus is going to God the Father on your behalf. So don't stop pushing into the presence of God. It says that Bartimaeus cried all the more, that he continued to push into God. And when Jesus stopped, notice what happened. Jesus stops and then says, call him to me. See, I found this. As I keep calling on God, eventually God will call me. What a powerful, powerful reminder for us.
And so I want to encourage you. You've been crying out to God for your children. Continue to cry out to God. You've been praying to God for your spouse to come to the Lord. Continue to cry out to God. Maybe you don't have a spouse and you've been praying that God would send you that man of God or that woman of God into your life. Continue praying to God. And most importantly, let's continue to cry out to God for the salvation of those that are in our lives and in our sphere of influence. Let's continue to cry out to God that our churches would rise up with the love and power of Jesus and make an impact into our worlds. Let's continue to pray that the Christians that are called by the name of the Father, that are called by Jesus, would go out and be salt and light in our communities. Let's continue to cry out to God, regardless of what's standing in the way of us, let's keep, like Bartimaeus, pushing in to God. And so the question that I have for you is this, do you have the perseverance to keep pushing in to God? See, our dreams would die from time to time. Our dreams will be challenged. These things that God has called us to will sometimes shake right before our very eyes. And that's why it's in moments like that that we have to remember that it is God who started this work and he who began a good work in us is faithful to see it through to completion. But we can't get to completion without moments of continuing to cry out to God. I love how this story ends. The story ends by saying that Bartimaeus threw off his cloak and he leapt up and ran to Jesus. And when he gets to Jesus, Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? It's interesting because the story that Mark's gospel tells right before Bartimaeus is the account of two of Jesus' disciples, James and John, coming to Jesus in private. And they say, we want you to do for us whatever you ask of me. And Jesus asks them the same question that he asks Bartimaeus. He says to them, what do you want me to do for you? And so we see that Mark is giving us this interpretation hint that these two stories are connected. And what do we see in the first story? We see the disciples of Jesus are selfish. They're vain. They're asking for uh, glory. They want to be high ups in the kingdom of God. And they're thinking in earthly political terms. Yet we see the contrast in Bartimaeus as he's begging for the restoration of his sight. He asks for mercy from the Son of God. And I think that we see the prayer that Jesus answers. Jesus heals him. He doesn't give positions of glory to James and John. He actually shows them how for them to serve in his kingdom, they have to become servants and slaves of all if they're going to be great. But he gets to Bartimaeus and he heals him. He says, what do you want from me, Lord, that I would receive my sight? And he heals him. And he says this thing to him. He says, your faith has made you whole. See, the reality is that we're not going to be able to have a life where faith isn't possible. And so I want to encourage you. Have faith that the God who started it in your life is the God who will finish it. Have faith that because God has called you, that it will be done. And that as you walk it out, you may get in moments where you have to keep praying and you have to keep persevering in faith, but trust that as you're leaning into God and as you're holding on to him with all you have, that God is not only faith, not only able, but God is faithful to see it come to pass. And then it ends by saying that he followed him on the way. See, when Bartimaeus was fully healed, he didn't go away and go in to find his family or go into the city or see the things that he couldn't see before. No, when Bartimaeus was healed, he continued with Jesus. And that's really what my prayer is for you and my prayer is for me, that we would continue with Jesus. That we wouldn't just come to Jesus for what we can get from him, but that we would come to Jesus to continue with him. I want to leave you with this I want you to picture Bartimaeus sitting on this cloak. This cloak was everything to him in that day and age. In the first century and really beyond the first century AD, really in the first century and second century uh, BC, often a beggar had a cloak. And this cloak was everything for them. It was a jacket whenever things got cold. It was a blanket for them to sleep under at night. And it also served as a cushion for them to sit on and when they sat on the cushion, 
a passerby could look at the look at the cloak and tell that they were homeless or that they were in need and they would put their money on the cloak. I want you to think about, you've probably seen a guitarist that is sitting out in front of a store with his guitar case open and you put the money in the guitar case. Well, that's what this cloak was. Yet Mark says intentionally in verse 50 that he throws off the cloak and runs to Jesus. See, Bartimaeus was leaving everything that he had trusted and everything that he had placed his security in behind in order to get to Jesus. This is a perfect picture of discipleship. It's a perfect picture of letting go of all the things that stand in the way and running to Jesus. And so as I leave you today, I want to encourage you. Let go of the cloak. Let go of that thing that's been a fallback plan. Trust God. Keep praying. Keep persevering. Turn your $7 into a mighty miracle of God. Let your faith in God be what 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 draws you closer to him as you walk away from the cloak and walk toward the Christ and watch what he does in your life. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would give us the grace and the strength to walk away from the cloak. As we, like Bartimaeus, are hearing of Jesus, let us respond in a positive way. Let us cry out to you. May our prayers be even more passionate and even more penetrating of heaven than ever before. And I pray that we would rise up, leave the cloak behind, come to you, that we would continue to push into you, even if the crowd, even if our emotions, even if our situations try to tell us no. Help us continue to chase after you. God, we love you. We honor you. and We ask for a complete healing of our spiritual eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you for sticking with me. I pray that you continue to persevere, even like Bartimaeus, that you would push through in your prayer life. I want to thank you for being with us today. Also, I want to ask you to uh, take some time to pray about being a financial partner with Forward Church. There are many of you who have been watching online that give regularly to uh, our website or you either text to give. And I want to say thank you for that because you're financially partnering with us, us, you and us. We are making our church, Forward Church, share the gospel like never before. We're actually going into other states via our online presence. We're working at building a better connection point for our online campus, as well as leaning into things with our in-person campus here in Virginia. I want you to know we couldn't do that without you. We couldn't leverage the gospel. We couldn't leverage technology without you. So as you give to Forward Church, thank you so much for all that you're doing, partnering with us and us partnering with God to help people move forward with God. We couldn't do it without you guys, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, I love you folks, and I can't wait to see you next Sunday right here at Church Online. Bye, guys.